I wanted to give you my thoughts on free agency. It effectively started at the Combine, and on Monday we'll find out you know, what teams have been doing uh, over the last sort of week because they've got all the information they need from the agents in Indianapolis that will have taken that away, and I suspect that a large portion of the league will already know where certain players are going to go, how much they're going to cost, and, and all of that stuff. So we're going to start finding out on Monday, and you know you can't help but go online at a time like this, and whoever you follow, whichever team it is that you're following, there will be a whole bunch of fans and media saying, "Hey, maybe the team could sign this guy." You know, fans will start rallying behind certain players at certain positions that they want their team to sign. You know, there's this kind of excitement being generated. People will react with disappointment when players they want go somewhere else. They will get a bit carried away when their team signs somebody that they deem to be a real quality addition. My thought process going into this free agency in 2024 is one of just, just not caring whatsoever. I have absolutely no excitement for a free agency in terms of players coming in. I'm excited to see where all of these big name free agents go. It's a fantastic day in the NFL calendar where you just sort of turn on social media and it's one signing after another. It's very entertaining to sort of follow it along. But I'm, I'm almost hoping not to see any news from the Seahawks. You know, I'd, I don't want them to go and spend huge money in free agency. I think the last 12 months has given me real clarity on what I feel about free agency because a year ago I wanted to see them go and do something but I think that was more a case of just feeling a little bit of desperation the, the Pete Carroll era was just so stale I wanted a reason to believe a reason to get excited and when I see it pop up that Draymond Jones is signing with the Seahawks it was like wow they've signed one of the big name free agents he's at a good age it gave you sort of a reason to think maybe he could be really good and let's see how he gets on. And you go and watch the highlights on YouTube and you sort of listen to people saying what a good signing that is. It was interesting. It it made it seem like the Seahawks meant business ahead of a draft where they had a whole bunch of picks and your imagination sort of runs wild a little bit. But sort of 12 months on, that Draymond Jones signing just looks like a bit of a, a lead weight really around the franchise in terms of cap. And they've consistently got themselves into bad contracts. They've just had to dump a load of them. Jamal Adams, Quandre Diggs, Will Disley. At this time of year, the Seahawks have not done their best business for 11 years. You know, they sort of really set a high bar quite early on as a franchise because I quite like the moves they did in 2011 as well. Zach Miller, Sidney Rice, Robert Gallery didn't really work out, but you could sort of see the thought process there and it it was really encouraging. And then when it got to 2013 and they needed to sort of take that final step to go and get Bennett and Averill for what they did, felt like an absolute heist. It's still even barely believable they're able to do it now, looking back. And that was great. They've never been able to repeat that, whether it's big signings, cheap signings, prove-it deals, reclamation projects there's never really been any major hits in free agency for the Seahawks since then. So when it comes to this time of year, I'm more fearful, suspicious of what's going to happen than excited. And then I was sort of thinking, okay, let's have a look at the list of free agents that are available. And obviously if the Seahawks signed Chris Jones on Monday, which isn't going to happen, but if they did, you'd think, wow, what a signing, you know, they've got and got one of the best pass rushers in the NFL. But when you actually look at the rest of the players that are towards the top end of the list and and you keep going down, you think there's actually not that, they're just not elite players here. These are second level players that are going to get first top tier level contracts. And I don't want the Seahawks to go down that road. You know, they've, they've drawn a line under the Diggs, Adams, Disney contracts this week. They're going to have to do more work in the future on other contracts that are probably a bit bigger than they should be. And I would rather avoid any of that stuff moving forward by being really disciplined in free agency here, trying to get the cap situation sorted and setting up some new rules for this franchise as they look to move forward now under a new era, minus Pete Carroll, with Mike McDonald, with John Schneider calling the shots. And some of those rules would be things like 
be really suspicious of players who you're about to give a third contract to because those deals often do not work. If you have a legendary player or a great, a great quarterback, then of course a third contract makes a lot of sense. But if it's for a good, not great player who is either in his 30s or approaching 30, a huge, massive contract is often a mistake. And I say that as somebody who is really open to the Seahawks re-signing Leonard Williams, but there's that sort of one, I've got one sort of little character on one shoulder going, yeah, bring him in, that's great. No, he's a good player. And then on the other shoulder, I've got somebody saying, you need to be really wary of that contract. The last thing the Seahawks want to do is sign him for, let's say, $20 million a year. Him then start to get injuries, his play be, like I say, good, not great. And you're just looking at that contract and going, why are you paying him $20 million a year again? It, it doesn't make any sense. So be really suspicious of those third contracts. Only pay big money to players who are either top, top players at their position or have the potential to get there. I think a good example of somebody like that is DK Metcalf. When he signed his new contract and, the, and now that he's sort of into that new contract, I think he still has the potential, as he did when he signed the deal, to become one of the better receivers in the NFL. So I'm comfortable with a contract like that. When you start to go down, you know, there's no way that, for example, I'd have paid, ever paid Jamal Adams or, or Quandre Diggs what they ended up getting. And I think you have to be very, very wary of those big, big contracts for non-elite players. You have to be strict. You have to be disciplined. If you get a good player as a rookie, but they don't become great players, I think as you get towards the end of that contract, you either have to sort of think, okay, do we need to be opportunistic here and get something via trade while we can? Or do we just have to let them walk and we have to continue to draft and develop? So I'd be really suspicious of paying non-elite players as well. And then the other thing is just don't go chasing misses. So what I mean by that is if this week, if the Seahawks don't land Leonard Williams, let's say another team comes out big, goes all in on Leonard Williams, plucks him away from you. What I don't want the Seahawks to do is then go and offer an undeserving contract or contracts to, let's say, two other players in an attempt to make up the difference. And the the reason I'm sort of being very specific with that example is that's exactly what they did with Jadavian Clowney. They said he was the priority re-sign in 2020. They then had a number for Clowney, which he obviously wasn't happy with. I think the Seahawks, well, I think it's fairly obvious that they thought, They'd made the best offer. Nobody else was offering more. So what would happen is Jadavian Clowney would assess the market and end up signing in Seattle and they'd feel very good about it. But what actually happened is Jadavian Clowney basically stuck two fingers up at them, as we'd say over here in England, and said, I'm not signing for anything less than I want. And if I'm and I'll be a pain in the arse for the rest of the year and and drag this out until somebody gives me what I want. And then if no one's offering that, well. I'll take, you know, you know, probably cut his nose off to spite his face. Not probably, he did. But to prove a point, he sort of played it to his own tune. And then because the Seahawks were there, they had a decision to make then. It was like, well, what do you do? Do you go and give him the money that he wants to come? Do you just leave it? Or do you go to Bruce Irving and Benson Mayower and say, oh, okay, we're familiar with them. And then you end up paying, I mean, the Benson Mayower contract was okay. I guess it wasn't problematic, but they gave Bruce Irving something like a 30% pay increase on his Carolina salary when he didn't seem to have any market at all. And they gave him a big pay increase and thought, right, that's two players for the price of Clowney that we're going to bring in. And and the, and then call that a pass rush, and they'd gone from Frank Clark to Jadavian Clowney to Irvin and Mayowa in the space of two years, and that was no good. So don't do that. You know, if Leonard Williams moves on somewhere else, don't give some old average defensive tackle a thirty percent pay increase to come to Seattle. Just accept it. Just accept your lot. Let the market come to you consider options in the draft. And quite frankly, if the Seahawks just sat it out next, you know, on Monday, I'd be completely content with that. 
I just do not spend bad money. And you know, when you think about what the the Seahawks main issues are, and you know, people have all sorts of opinions on this. You know, they'll either look to the holes on the team, which currently like safety and linebacker, or they'll look at their preferred area for improvement, interior offensive line, let's say. And they'll say, well, well, that's Seattle's biggest need. You ain't solving any of those problems in free agency, I'm afraid. Like the Seahawks cannot go from what they've been for the last two years, which is a nine and eight team, in my opinion, to anything that's barely relevant next season by signing players in free agency over the next few days. The way that the Seahawks are going to become a serious contender is sort of building their team with these sort of core principles, you need to go and get a franchise quarterback and like a young, long-term franchise quarterback. I know that the Geno Smith fan club will hate the thoughts that I've just suggested that they they desperately need to go and get a quarterback. But Geno Smith's 34 this year. He's a good bridge. You know, if they drafted a quarterback this year, for example, it'd be ideal to let a young quarterback sit behind Geno Smith and then take over in a year's time. I've always said that that'd be the ideal, and I hope that they have the opportunity to do that one day rather than just chucking in a rookie starter straight away because we've seen with other players that has gone very badly in recent years. You know, not CJ Stroud is the exception, not the rule. So that would be the ideal, but they have to go and get that. And when you have a brilliant quarterback, and when I say brilliant quarterback, that is, you know, you have to say Mahomes first of all because he's legendary, but then it's also the Burrows and the Herberts and the Allens, Lamar. You know, it's it's that kind of player that we're talking about here. When you get that kind of player, it can cover a lot of flaws that you have elsewhere. You then got to give them weapons. I think the Seahawks have got some great weapons already. You've got to give them some protection. The Seahawks have got to be looking to improve that, you know. The ideal situation for me would be to get that quarterback in this year, maybe, so that you can have this offseason and next offseason to fix that offensive line so that it's ready for when the quarterback takes over. I think doing it the other way around, oh, go and build the offensive line now and then hope in a year or two you go and get the quarterback. For me, that that's just kicking the can down the road on the quarterback, which is not a good idea. So get the quarterback and then maybe fix the line while Gino is still there. No offense, Gino, but I think that's probably the better way of doing it. But if you can get that quarterback, weapons, better protection, you can win a lot of football games. And then on the other side of the ball, you need a difference-making pass rusher. Now, they are really hard things to find. If you speak to any GM and go, a franchise quarterback, pass protection, and a difference-making defensive lineman, they go, yeah, everybody's looking for that. Those are the hardest things to find because everybody's looking for that. But there's no alternative. Like, if you want the Seahawks to be a serious, legit contender, I think you've got to go and find those things, and you've probably got to find them in the draft. Otherwise, the Seahawks will just continue to be 8, 9, 10 win team, middling, one of those teams that are stuck in the middle, one of those teams that's always being mocked in the teens. Hey, maybe they could go and get this pass rusher, this offensive lineman, this ex-player, that's a need for them. They improve that area. They come back next year. They're picking in exactly the same spot again. You know, eventually you have to, if you want to be a serious, serious contender, I think you do have to draft a quarterback. You do have to give him some weapons. You do have to draft a difference-making defensive lineman. You've got to find those things. And that's up to John Schneider to do it. And when you look at, you know, the top teams out there, like the Chiefs are the Chiefs because they drafted Patrick Mahomes. They didn't fix the offensive line until Mahomes had been to two Super Bowls. They lost the second Super Bowl and then they fixed the offensive line and spent absolute massive resource in it, in free agents, drafting players to go and fix the front for Mahomes so that what happened against Tampa Bay in that second Super Bowl would never happen again. They got in weapons. They've actually traded one of those his best weapons away, but they've, they've tried to sort of add more. They, you know, they spent a first round pick on a running back. They've spent high picks on receivers. Um, and they drafted Chris Jones at the top of round two to be that difference-making pass rusher. Now, I understand, again, saying, well, just do what the Chiefs did is easier said than done. But that has to be kind of like the mindset in Seattle for me. It's like, right, okay, 
get as a quarterback. You have to you have to look at every group of quarterback, every quarterback in this group that's in this year, and go, who are the players that can be a franchise quarterback? Now, if there are none, there's nothing you can do. You move on. But if John Schneider and Mike McDonald look at this and go, okay, well, we've got intel on McCaff- McCarthy, and we do think he's a franchise quarterback, or as I suspect, I think John will really like Drake May. Okay, where is he going to f- fall? Is he going to fall? Where is he going to fall to where you can maybe go up and get him? Do they think Michael Penix can be a, a franchise quarterback? Where is he going to be drafted? What do they think of Bo Nix? What do they think of Spencer Rattler? Do you see what I mean? Like you, You've kind of got to go through the list. And I do think there's a chance that they will look at you know, the quarterbacks in this group and be be quite intrigued. So if you can find somebody, and if you, if you have to be aggressive to go and get them, so be it. You go and get them. You add them in. You tip that box. You have drafted a left tackle with a top 10 pick. So you've sort of set the ball rolling two years ago on trying to fix that offensive line. Hopefully you can get Abe Lucas back. Hopefully Anthony Bradford and Olu Olu Watimi can, you, you drafted them. You know, hopefully, you know, are you giving up on them after one year? And you've got a new staff now. Can Scott Huff turn them into somebody, you know, to players that are worth having? You know, you've really only got one hole there, which is left guard. I think there's some really good left guard candidates in this draft. So, you know, can you fix that? Yeah, I don't think it's that impossible to fix that offensive line. And then you've got your, your weapons, and then it's just about going and getting that that defensive player, which, you know, when you think of players like Jones and, you know, Max Crosby and TJ Watt, it was a late first-round pick. You know, you don't necessarily have to be picking in the top five to find someone who can fit that bill. So you've got to go and find them, you know. I think there are really good athletic players in this in this draft, for example. It could be that, you know, maybe Braden Fisk falls because of this injury flag that Tony Paul Inge reported. Maybe he could come in and be your difference-making uh, defensive lineman with the testing that he's shown. Maybe it's Ruka Roro. You know, he's got loads of skill and potential to come in and and, and perhaps be a Justin Manabike time. You, see, you get the point. You know, you've got to go and find those players. And you're not going to do it all in one draft. I'm just sort of throwing names out that are in this class. But if you can get those things, if you can get those pieces, then it's funny how, oh, a hole at linebacker, you can fill that, you know, with a veteran. Oh, a hole at safety, you can fill that with a veteran. You know, it's about having those weapons, the quarterback, the protection, and the difference-making pass rusher. And right now, the Silks only got the weapons. So they've got to fix the other things. So as I say, nothing's going to get sold, in my opinion, in free agency next week. The Silks have got to start to fi- fill their problems in the draft. I thought they had two fantastic drafts in 22 and 23. And I think they picked a lot of good players and they've created a young, talented core. But what they haven't really found, unless Devin Witherspoon's going to become this and Jackson Smith and Jigba, at the moment, as we sit here today, are players that you genuinely feel they are elite players in the making who are going to be like top five at their position. They've got to start turning some of these singles into home runs. So that's something they've got to do here. If they can do that with quarterback, they do it with the pass rush, then great. But they've got to start doing that. So save your money. Don't splurge. Look for calculated opportunities. Let the market come to you. Look for value. You know, who are the safeties who are young, good age, physical, tackle well, fast, versatile, that fit this scheme? You know, don't overpay for Jordan Brooks. Let the market come to you with him. If it's not going to come to you, look elsewhere. Leonard Williams, see what his market is. Be prepared to walk away if the cost's too much. Check in on the offensive lineman. Just see, you know, because, but, but make sure that you're not just going out there and being reckless and inheriting more bad contracts that are going to lead to more dead money that are going to lead to more financial issues down the line. It's really hard to do that when you're determined to be competitive every single year, which the Seahawks clearly are. And they don't want to have a mediocre first season under Mike McDonald. But I think sort of patience, maturity, discipline is important for the Seahawks, not splurging. And there isn't really anybody. that I'm sort of Frankie Louvu maybe. But I wouldn't want to go and pay massive money for him. That I'm sort of thinking I'd love to see them in Seattle. I think louvu has got that kind of attitude and the intensity and the, and the playing style that I'd love to see but not somebody I'd want them to go and spend $15 million a year on, for example. So we'll see. But I still think Seattle's main issues and the way that the team needs to be built, it needs to be through the draft and those key positions starting this year.
So there we go. Those are my thoughts. And I'll just finish with this. The more I listen to Mike McDonald and John Schneider, the more I think they are seriously considering moving up. And that should not be a surprise. You know, McDonald's has been around McCarthy. Jay Harbour has been around McCarthy. They've got great intel. Drake May looks very much like a John Schneider quarterback. You know, Michael Penix, I can imagine him having his favourites in that building because Ryan Grubb is there and so is Scott Huff. So they've got all the intel they could need on two of the quarterbacks. They've also played like Michigan game plan for Penix, so they also know a lot on him. You know, the, 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 bit, the guys who've been in college will know a lot about May and Knicks and potentially Spencer Rattler and people like this. I think there's a decent chance that if they get the opportunity to move up, they will. The opportunity might not come. It might be too expensive or the teams might outbid them. But I think they're very open-minded to knowing we've got to go and get a young quarterback. And their sort of language and their non-committal language towards Geno Smith as the starter next year makes me think that they do want to set up some kind of a competition here. But I think it'd be ideal for them if, let's say it was McCarthy or May, both 21, no pressure to start them this year. You play Geno Smith, you introduce that quarterback in 12 months' time. I think that would be ideal. And I think it's certainly something that they are considering. And I think they're right to consider it. Anyway, let me know your th thoughts in the comments section. Um, next week, if there are any sort of big newsy free agenty things, we'll do something on the channel, whether that is a stream, whether that is sort of instant reaction videos. Silksdraftblog.com will be covering it all. I've put my updated post combine horizontal board on silksdraftblog.com as well. Go and check that out. I'm going to article on Sunday, which will be reflecting a lot of the things that I've been discussing in this video as well in written form. So again, go and check that out. Let me know what you think about free agency. Do you agree with what I've said? Have you got different thoughts? The players that you're pining for, for the Silks to go and get? Let me know in that comment section. Like the video. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a video. Until next time, bye for now.